Okay, right. So I'm, I'm chairing this afternoon's win meeting. Just want to welcome everybody. Uh, could I just ask, first of all, everybody mutes unless, apart from the speaker, unless they're actually speaking, so we don't get any, um, you know, background noises that uh, happens to be going on behind you. Um, this afternoon, we've got Jan from Sweden. I'm sure we're all probably very alarmed at the uh, the success of the right in Sweden after years and years and years of the Social Democratic Party running things on apparently fairly successful social democratic model. And all of that has probably come has come crashing down amongst all the neoliberalism that's on the uh, increase in the world. So we've invited along Jan. Jan, who, if you've read your intro, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the information. But he's the leader of the Workers' Par Party Group, publisher of the New Workers' Journal in Sweden, and he's been a councillor since 1991, just been... Um, re elected So without reading it all, like basically Jan's been campaigning uh, on for, for, for this party for a very long time. Um, so we've brought him along today to talk to us about what's going on and then we can have a discussion. Uh, are you there, Jan? Jan? Hello, Hello. this is... Uh... Hi, Jan. How this long... is not Jan, this is Davis. Uh, I'm just... just he, he's, he's on his way. He right, pick... okay. Things We're up. about ready to start now, so is he? Yeah, is he... yeah. You call him Jan, by the way, okay? Jan, right, okay. Yeah. I didn't even try a second there when you get that wrong. <laughs> right, when Jan gets here, I shall ask him how long he wants to speak for. Yeah. Um, Pam? Yes? I'm, seeing as I live in Sweden, I've also got tub and soap need to... Right. Uh, what I'm, Jan, Jan and I talked about it and thought that it would be useful if I um, used some of the pictures that I took from TV mm -hmm. when I was watching the election and do uh, present the parties. And then he will um, do the actual uh, analysis of what it means. Okay. So, so are you yeah. wanting to... Yeah. If you, I have the opportunity to use um, slides, I've got a PowerPoint, very brief PowerPoint right. presentation. Um, I could quickly introduce right. the whole concept because it's very different from Britain. We have eight political parties in Parliament yeah. just to so stop. Are you want, are you wanting to do the presentation with Jan? And we're going to let Jan do his presentation yeah. and you come in next. First. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's fine. I okay, I think yeah, that's great. That it, it might be easier to follow if you know the background about the parties. It only takes a few minutes, they're five slides. Right, but we're starting with Jan, presumably. So we'll need to make you a co-host. Are you going to sort that, Roger, to make Maddie yeah. a co-host? Yeah, yeah. I'll make you a, a, yeah. a co-host. But Jan's not actually back yet, is he? Yeah. Where's he gone? Could you make Jan a co-host as well? Because we, we have a slide we want to show. Ah, yeah. Okay, make Jan a Okay, uh, I'll make you a co-host, buddy. so... Thank you. All right. All right, yeah, and how long would you like to speak for? And I can just keep an eye on the time. 45 minutes. How long? 45 minutes. It's a bit long, that. Can you do it a bit less? Because we've only got two hours for the meeting and people will want to say things and ask you questions. So, you, you know, if, if you say you could do 20 and then save the rest, because the rest of it you will get a chance to say later uh, in the meeting. There, would you there's no way. no way on 20. I can, I can 30? do... 30? Well, I can try. Have a go. I'll, I'll tell you after 20 minutes, OK? Because Maddie, Maddie wants to present some stuff as well, and obviously we want to allow time for people dis to discuss so we can finish at 6 o'clock. So I'll give you a nudge at 20 minutes, Jan, OK? Yeah, smashing, thank you. And if you, haven't, if you haven't muted yourself already, could everybody do it that isn't speaking, please? Thank you. Right, OK. Are you ready? Uh, could, could somebody make uh, Jan a co-host? Right, Roger, are you doing that? Do I do a 
Okay. Do you want me to start? Hold on. Yes, yes, yes. We, we need to be able to, to screen share first. Yes, I've just had a look. Roger, are you making you a co-host or am I? Can we have more than one co-host at a time? I think yeah, you have I, to I do made Maddy a co-host. Are you saying that? Well, Jan says he wants to be a co-host as well. Oh, Is that yeah. right, Jan? Right. Yeah, 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 I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, let, and, then, and then we can make a start. Uh, take this memory of can you hear me? Hello, yes. <laughs> because I can't see any of you. Oh, um, I can see you. I, I want to try and um, reconnect. All right. When you come back, then we'll have to make you a co-host again. Yeah. Okay, Maddy. Right. Okay, Jan, do you want to make a start, please? All right. Uh, I will try. I will try to... Uh, explain what's happening in Sweden and uh, the result of the Swedish national election. Also, if you have questions about the work of uh, the, Swe the Workers' Party group in Umeå, uh, we can come back to that later. But to understand uh, the result of the Swedish national election, there are two things I will, will start with. And firstly, Sweden still belongs to the group of most equal OECD countries. Despite a rapid surge of income inequality since the early 1990s. But the growth of inequality between 1985 and the early 2010s was the largest in Sweden among all OECD countries. And this have changed Sweden a lot. And I, I'm sure that everyone of you have heard a lot about this increase in inequality in Sweden. But the second thing is the failure of Swedish immigration, immigration policy. Few issues, if any, in modern times have been as important and at the same time as difficult to discuss as Swedish immigration policy. For a long time, a debate based on facts was replaced by an unsubstantiated battle between xenophobes and those who in turn were the enemies of xenophobes. The winners in all this was undoubtedly the Swedish Democrats, a former Nazi party. What is beyond doubt is that Swedish immigration policy has undergone a dramatic change. The change began in the period of 2006 to 2010 and took a dramatic form with a deal between the four traditional bourgeois parties then in government and the Green Party in March 2011. And in 2014, the Social Democrats joined this immigration deal. Immigration policy in Sweden went from being tight and regulated to what was in practice free immigration to Sweden. The change also applied to labor immigration. And let me describe this dramatic change 
through a couple of tables. If we start to compare Sweden with Sweden, historically, you can see if you move to the most right column that the yearly average of granted residency permits to asylum seekers and their families was 11,000 during the years 2001 to 2005. And then it doubled between the years 2006 and 2010. And then it was a big increase again to 36,444 average yearly. And then there was another increase to 40, about 45,000 between 2016 and 2020. If we look at asylum seekers and compare Sweden to the rest of the European Union, we can look at the six years uh, 2010 to 2015. Sweden's population share of the European Union was 2%. Sweden's share of asylum seekers was between 10 and 15%. And let's look at a special year, 2015. Asylum seekers to the European Union was in total 1 million and 200,000. And uh, that was 2.3 for every thousand inhabitants in, a, in any Euro country in the European Union. But in Sweden, it was 16.6. Now, those figures are not popular. <laughs> no, they, they are not well known, they are not discussed, and they are not popular to discuss. But still, these figures are the facts. So these changes in immigration policy have had a huge impact in a number of areas. For example, neither the labor or the housing markets were able to cope with the situation. This has led to a situation with high unemployment, many low paid workers and overcrowding among immigrants. The result has been increased income inequality and segregation. And in some areas, this has led to the emergence of parallel social structures. How did this happen? Well, it is partly due to two big lies spread by both politicians and the media which helped to put the wet blanket over the debate. The first lie is about what the Swedish immigration policy should be compared to. The uncompromising supporters of what was in practice free immigration, mainly the Greens, the left party, one of the bourgeois parties, the center party, and also 
social democracy to some degree. They did their utmost to belittle the number of refugees Sweden received. They did this by referring to the fact that in 2015, there were about 60 million refugees worldwide. However, what really mattered was the figure on how many refugees came to the European Union and how many of these Sweden received. And one thing is crystal clear, no other country took in nearly as many refugees as Sweden did. In the year 2015, if we compare Sweden with uh, United Kingdom, Sweden took 33, 33 times as many uh, asylum seekers as the United Kingdom. And if anyone believes that this will not have an impact on the country, well, that, that person doesn't live on the planet Earth. And this, this have changed Sweden. This have had an enormous impact on, on uh, Swedish political debate. The impact on the Swedish climate, the political climate uh, taken upon the, the bigger class uh, divide, which was the biggest in, uh, in, in, in of all the OECD countries has, has changed Sweden. But the discussion has not been uh, how should we fight increasing uh, income inequality. The discussion has uh, concentrated on immigration. And in this situation, uh, the former Nazi party, the Swedish uh, Democrats have won. In several cities, the antagonism between some immigrant groups and representatives of the majority community have been very intense. I, I, um, I say, and I say it again, parallel social structures have emerged in which Swedish laws and the authorities responsible for enforcing them are not considered legitimate. Those working for such a development include Islamists, such as the Muslim Brotherhood and also criminal clans. The Muslim Brotherhood was a main force behind a hate campaign directed against Sweden's social services. The lies that these uh, social services kidnapped and brainwashed children of Muslims. And, and, and this was really a, a scaring thing. And uh, that, that was what uh, dominated the beginning of this year, 2022. And it must be seen against the background of the emergence of parallel societies. This is even more true for the violence that erupted during the Eastern in, in, in 2022. The violence was primarily directed against the police as representatives of Swedish society. 
And behind this was criminal clans and the Muslim Brotherhood or groups connected with the Muslim Brotherhood. Although a right-wing Quran burner from Denmark, Rasmus Paludan served as a pretext for that violence. In some places, the violence reached a level that could be described only as a low intensity civil war. I repeat, a low intensity civil war. The parallel social structures combined with the hate campaign directed against the social services in Sweden and the outbreak of violence show the depth of the fissures that have erupted, uh, developed in Swedish society. In this situation, there are three methods to choose from. The first is to refuse to see the connection between what is going on, uh, the existence of the Islamists uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood and the criminal networks, to refuse to see it. The second method is to first lump all Muslims in the country together and then attack all Muslims and thereby driving them into the arms of the Islamists and broader the base for criminal networks. And the third is to fight to try to involve uh, uh, Muslims in general to uh, defend the welfare state and try to, to, to create a split between Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups and Muslims in general. And um, the really tragic thing is that the most obvious representatives of the first approach to put a blind eye to, to all these uh, problems are the Greens, the left party, but mainly also the social democrats. For many years, the so-called left and the Greens, who is uh, often seen as part of the left, just put a blind eye to this. And the people who have taken all Muslims together, because this is mainly about Muslims, not immigrants in general. It has been the Swedish Democrats and to some degree, uh, even uh, the Christian Democrats. And uh, on, on the la last, during the last years, the, the Swedish uh, equivalent to the Tory party, Moderaterna, the moderates. And they have gone on the offensive here. The third method, integration through action, if, if you may call it, to try to involve people from the Muslim society in a fight to defend the welfare state, to, de to defend jobs. Well, we are trying to, to, uh, to do that on a local level, but there are no force, not the left party, not the social democrats, not the unions who try, because they are not, they, they, they will not try this method because they, they don't fight at all. Yeah, and you've been speaking for about 20 minutes now. Yeah. Now, this uh, 
the division of inequality, which has been very high in Sweden, and the problems with immigration. Uh, and and uh, what 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 have have that the Swedish labor market or the housing market haven't been able to cope with this. If if you are going to understand what took place in the election, you you must understand those things. So I will now say. Uh, a few words about uh, the election. As you know, Sweden is having a change of government and the big winners in the election was the former Nazi party, the Swedish Democrats. They got 20.5% of the votes, which was another increase to their highest vote ever. The Social Democrats, the Labour Party of Sweden, also increased their support and they received 30.3%, uh, which was an increase by 2%. <laughs> However, the Swedish Democrats they were the big winners in this election with their highest score ever. And the Social Democrats, they made their second worst election since uh, universal suffrage was implemented in 1921. And this is one of the most important factors in an analysis of the election result. Another important factor is uh, as follows. The Social Democrats, well, they went up 2.0%, but they made their gains at the expense of their own would-be coalition partners. And uh, when social, demo democ democ social Democracy made gains, uh, compared to their disastrous, uh, disastrous election result in 2018. The Green Party, the Left Party, and the uh, Bourgeois Party, who is connected with social democracy nowadays, they lost more than what the Social Democrats gained. So as a block, these four parties lost and uh, the, the main traditional bourgeois parties together with the former Nazi party gained, although it was very equal, but it was a difference that made a change in government uh, possible. And the main reason behind all of this was that the Social Democratic Party failed uh, to win back the votes of the blue collar workers from the Swedish Democrats. In fact, the support for the Social Democrats decreased even more among blue collar workers, while the support for the Swede Swedish, the Sweden Democrats, the former Nazi party. It is not a Nazi party today, but it is a former Nazi party. And they gain, gained among the blue collar workers. So today among blue collar workers, social Democrats have 32% and uh, the Swedish Democrats have 29%. So the gap is just 3%. Uh, in the election four years ago, the gap was 10%. Now it's 
and um, most analyses would claim that the social democrats are now forced to hand over power to the bourgeois bloc. But as we see it in the workers' party group, the truth is that the social democrats never truly regained the power that comes with being in government since the bourgeois alliance, uh, alliance led by he, he, he was called Frederick Reinfeldt, won the election back in 2006. The Social Democrats only regained the positions of government because after the 2014 election, it took three months of negotiations for the Social Democrats and the Green, the Green Party to form a stable base through a deal in December. The Social Democrats couldn't have their budget passed through uh, the parliament. And the Prime Minister Stefan Levin had to govern, govern with the budget of, of the bourgeois parties. And uh, the reason behind this was that the four bourgeois parties and the Swedish Democrats voted against it. The government consisting of the Social Democrats and the Greens didn't have a majority behind their own budget even. And this had been the situation even after uh, the form the, the election in 2018. In two, after the election in 2018, it took four months of negotiations, just like in, in Germany, before the social democratic uh, prime minister, Stefan Löfven, was appointed prime minister again. And you're just coming up to 30 minutes now. Right. I will... So uh, I will end this. Uh, so once again, if you look at this period of, of eight years, social democracy have ruled on a, 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 a bourgeois budget for three of the eight years. They have uh, destroyed their own uh, reforms. And, and the most important is job security. They have started to undermine uh, collective bargaining. They have tried to take steps to uh, uh, make housing a uh, free market. It has been regulated. And they have adopted a bourgeois tax policy. So when we say that social democracy lost uh, the power of government, well, they have not really regained the power of government. They regained the positions of government in 2014, but they have been too small to have the power. Their compromises have made it impossible to regain the confidence from the blue collar workers. So the blue collar workers was abandoned by social democracy to a, a, a large degree when it came to class issues. And because 
social democracy did not have a trustworthy policy when it came to migration, then the former Nazi party to, could make big, big and terrible gains among the blue collar workers. And that's and you're, how, you've done 30 minutes now. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry to stop you. Any material? Can I, can I finish no. this sentence? Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. That's why among the blue collar workers, social democracy today have 32% of the vote and the former Nazi party has 29% of the vote. And that's the sad story. Now I'm finished. Thanks very much for that, Jan. I know you've got some of the material prepared, but in the course of this discussion, you know, I'm quite sure you'll be able to bring, bring that back into it. Uh, I'm going to bring Maddie Gray in next, who lives in Sweden. She wants to show, to give us a slideshow to explain things a little bit more. So, uh, Maddie, would you like to start doing that, please? Uh, can you see my slide? Not at the moment, no. Um, no. No. Um, I've, I can see my slides. Doesn't... Right, you've not shared your screen. There should be a, there's a green button at the bottom. Uh, which says share, well, it's green on mine anyway. It says share screen at the bottom of your screen. Can you see it? It's about in the middle somewhere. No, but I'll try and go back to yeah, the. You need to click on to share screen and then click on your, right. what you're trying to show us. Okay. Um, yeah, on mine, it's right in the middle at the bottom. Yeah, I've just got to go back. I really am sorry about that. Um, let me, here we are, back there, share screen, right. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And now I've just got to find the, oh. I think this is it. Yes. Okay. Is something coming up? Ah, yes. Bingo. Yes, you're there, Maddie. You can see it now. I yeah. am sorry about this. I thought right. it was, um, better at it. Um, view. Present a view. Right. Now, can you see it's a page saying right shift in Swedish yes. directions? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Perfect. Now you've read that. Here you see pictures in the background of Margareta Andersson, the outgoing Social Democratic Premier, and the Ulf Christensen, the incoming um, moderate Premier. Presumably he'll be the Premier. Um, she took over, Margareta Andersson took over from Leven, Stefan Leven, a few months ago, probably about a year ago. Um, and she has increased, you can see here, um, 30 over just over 30% for the Social Democrats. The four, there are two blocks in Parliament at the moment. The left party. The social, can you see my pointer moving? The V stands for left. The yes, I can see your pointer, yeah. Stands for Social Democrats. MP are the Greens. And the, the C is the far, former Farmers Party. It's also green inclined. Then you have what we call the blue block. And that's because the emblems are all blue. We have the Liberals, which did the worst 
one of the worst um, election results ever. We have the Christian Democrats, the conservative moderates, and the big winners, the former Nazi party, the Sweden Democrats. Now, um, this, these are the proportion of votes that they received. We, here in my next slide, we have the two leaders. Ulf Christensen, who's likely to be the next prime minister, and the very good looking, and I'm sure that plays a role for some people who vote for him. Um, Yimmy, Jimmy Orkerson, Yimmy, as we say in Swedish, Yimmy Orkerson. You can see the newscaster there. Here we see in the next one, I'm, I just wanted to give you some idea of what mm. the politics looks like. There's a line in this chart and also in the previous chart. That is the 4% that you have to get in order to get for your party to get any seats in, government, in the parliament. And if you get less than 4% of the national vote, you can't put your party in. Locally, you have different qualifications so that you can get parties in that have a good support in local election, but not at a national level. At this point, I'd also like to point out that when you vote, you vote for at least three different levels of government. You vote for the national government, you vote for the regional government, and you vote for your local government, your municipality. And they can all be quite, have quite different um, results. And as we'll see, there are um, differences in some some of the metropoles. Here you see the number of votes that each party has. And this is where the deciding line comes between whether or not your side gets into parliament or whether it uh, gets into the government, which basically in the way Sweden functions, what they call the government is actually what we call the cabinet. It's the people who make the decisions, it's the ministers and the deputy ministers who form the government in Sweden. But actually, as I say, it's the cabinet. Matt, I'm sorry to interrupt, we're getting a bit, it's getting, a, we, we need to allow some time for discussion. And we, we, we go in okay, really I've got now, two, just, to, just to have, have that slides. in mind. This Excellent. one and That's, one more. Thank you very much, yeah. And here you can see that between the two blocks, there is only a question of three seats difference. The last slide that I've got is a hopeful slide, it represents Stockholm in this case, but in um, Gothenburg, there's a similar result. And I think there may be in a couple of other large, larger metropoles. And here you see the reds, left and Social Democrats and the Greens, the Greens and the Centre Party, which, as I say, is fairly close. They get a clear majority, very nearly 60%, and not quite 40%. You have the four right wing parties, or bourgeois parties, the Liberals, the Christian Democrats, the <coughs> Conservative Party, the Moderates. And here we have this pretty blue flower, which stands for the Sweden Democrats, the major winners of the election. Okay, that was me for this at this point. That's great. Thanks, Maddy. I'm sure that's that's a really useful sort of guide, really. So anybody that doesn't understand the electoral system in Sweden. Well, I thought that it's important Very to useful. understand.
to get do. a picture of the fact that there are eight parties. And okay, stuff. that's great. If you could just stop screen sharing, Maddie, and then yes, we'll move I on will. to this. That's I great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. So, can I? Can I? I'm going to throw the meeting open to questions and discussions now. Uh, Ian has already indicated to me that he'd like to say something. Ian Drummond. So, would you? Would you like to come in now, Ian? Please. Anybody else want to speak? If you just put your electronic hand up, and then I'll go. Oh, great, you're doing it. And then I'll call you up. Okay. Ian, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Hello, Sorry. Ian. Right. Um, I didn't realise there were two lead-offs, and then I didn't realise the second one was going to be so well, short. Well, they were, so just, yeah, uh, yeah, they weren't, they weren't right, really. Right. It was just we had we had a cool. speaker, and then Maddie offered us a second. All right, cool. Yeah, I missed Fire away. intro. Okay. Yeah, I just really had a couple of questions. First, for the um, the main speaker um, about the immigration stuff, I'm not sure if I quite agree with the emphasis. I think certainly I can see if there's... Um, uh, neoliberal inherited policies from the, I think the Reinfeld government really changed Sweden from what people outside Sweden think of it as into a much more Thatcherite style society and the Social Democrats don't seem to have changed it much back. Um, there's then a lot of immigration on top of that, these issues can emerge of infrastructure, but I think um, the emphasis has to be on um, raising services for, for everybody. And in terms of integration through action, yes, but maybe not so much of a, an emphasis on splitting the community, fighting the Muslim Brotherhood per se, but on uniting an action over that against the, um, against the government. Um, I mean, I must say from the UK, the comparison between Sweden and UK's uh, refugee statistics um, that uh, not many of us in the UK are, are proud of our record. Certainly on the left wing, we think it's too little, but interestingly on the right wing, they always still think that it's too much and that it's more than other countries. Um, however little it becomes, that becomes the uh, mantra. So simply having less factually doesn't necessarily mean that uh, right wing uh, press and uh, political party opinion would be, uh, would be um, appeased in that way um, from the British uh, kind of experience. Um, also a couple of unrelated questions though about the last few years of this Swedish government. Probably the most perplexing to me would be the COVID policy over the last couple of years where Sweden seemed to take a totally different approach from most of the rest of the world. But in a way that wasn't always the clearest. Uh, they had the, um, they were accused of wanting herd immunity, but the government position was always to minimize that stress, how similar it was to other countries, while obviously people who are um, more COVID skeptic in, in, in this country and others pointed to Sweden as a great example, but statistics did seem to suggest it was doing worse than its, um, neighbours in the Nordic countries that are the most, uh, uh, the best comparison. So how that issue, first of all, if you can throw any further light on it in, in general terms and how it impacted on the election, what the positions of the different parties were on it, um, the former Nazis, the left party, your own organisation and so on. Um, also, I saw that the head of the left party now is herself of refugee Heritage. I think she's an Iraqi Kurd. I might be wrong about, but certainly somebody who was a refugee. I think born abroad and came as a refugee as a child. And I wonder how that impacted on the situation. If that was a particular red rag to rule to the right or something for the opponents of xenophobia to rally around. I was certainly rooting for her um, from that perspective too. And in terms of the left party in general, what its position is as a former communist party, has it become more social democratic itself? Is it more like some of these new left organizations um, in, in other parts of Europe, like Die Linke or, or the left bloc in Portugal or the old Scottish socialists? Um, so yeah, what its position is and how you relate to it. And finally, just because we've been talking about it a lot in terms of Britain of late, um, 
is there any debate on the monarchy in Sweden, seeing as it's one of the other monarchies in Europe? The Social Democrats are in power for over 40 years continually. Was there ever any tensions between them and the palace, or is it a pared-down monarchy that doesn't really have as much of a political impact? How does that all, all work? Um, all right, thanks. Right, thanks very much for that, Ian. Now, we've got actually got eight hands up, so I'm going to have to... I'm going to take some more questions now. I'm going to have to ask everybody to be very... Uh, to stick to five minutes or less, if possible, so we've got a bit of a bit of time at the end for the questions to be answered. But I'd like to just change the queue order and invite Rolf to speak next. Are you ready to make your contribution, Rolf? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. <clears throat> I can... Um... Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, well, I, I can uh, say a little about uh, the situation in Denmark. <clears throat> because uh, Denmark and Sweden and Norway, for that uh, sake, are more or less the same. Um, but, um, well, the situation in Denmark is, is uh, the same as in, in Sweden, you can say, because but we are, going, we are going to have an election in uh, one or two months. And um, us in Sweden, we have uh, lots, <clears throat> lots of parties. We have 14 parties we can vote on. Well, the, the six of the parties are to the left and the eight are to the right. And uh, it seems that uh, the Bourgeois parties will get a majority now. Um, and, well, it's uh, quite chaotic how the political situation is. But in terms of uh, populist parties, uh, we can see that uh, Sweden is 20 years behind Denmark because we, we have had a populist party since the 90s called uh, Danish People's Party. And uh, as in Sweden, nobody, no parties want to collaborate with the Danish People's Party until 2001. In 2001, we got a, a bourgeois government and uh, uh, they used uh, the, the Danish People's Party as a uh, basis for the for their policy. And uh, the next eight years, we saw a, a restriction on immigration and so on. Um, and what we also saw was that uh, all the parties they took over the, um, the policy of, uh, or the program of Danish uh, People's Party, also the social democracy. So all the parties now against immigration and, uh, um, well, uh, besides, uh, well, we have two socialist parties that are, that are not so uh, much against. But anyway, um, uh, well, uh, we had the situation in Denmark uh, like the situation now in Sweden because uh, socialist, the uh, people's, Danish people's party got 22% in the election in 2015. And uh, after that, um, the Social Democracy got uh, the voters back and uh, they got a majority in, in uh, 2019. Uh, probably mostly because they, they had this uh, very right-wing um, policy on immigration. Um, and now we see that uh, Danish People's Party more or less has disappeared. It, it got 22%. Now it is uh, on 2% in the opinion polls. But uh, that doesn't mean that we have get, got rid of populist parties because new ones has coming up. We have a, a new bourgeois party. They uh, demand that all immigrants should leave Denmark and uh, they would, would like to sack 100,000 workers in the public sector. 
And suddenly we, we have got a, a new party that uh, former member of parliament who uh, has uh, created a party and call it uh, the Danish Democrats. Well, uh, nearly the same as Swedish Democrats. And uh, she has now 10% of the votes in the uh, Finnish polls. And uh, that is uh, people from from Danish People's Party, also members, also member in parliament who has, who has joined her party. So the situation is... Uh, well, you've been speaking for five minutes now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to put in. Yes, I wish, yes. <laughs> okay. And, uh, it shows that, uh, well, in 82, uh, the number of immigrants was 2%, 3%, and in 22, it is 14%. So, of course, these populist parties, they have something in uh, in their pocket but uh, but and they, well the, of course the immigrant is scapegoat for all the cuts and so on in the um, uh, capitalist uh, society so uh, it's easy and uh, also workers are of course um, uh, they, they they see uh, immigrants as cheap labor and uh, the capitalists they like to have immigrants uh, and, and cheap labor so and what i will well i'll finish with saying that nobody's coming forward with a solution no parties and um, not even the, the so-called socialist parties they are reformist parties and support the capitalist system in the, the end. So we are in volatile, um, volatile times and it looks it looks uh, very black, but that's all over the world, of course. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Rolf. Um, right, now John and Dominic, I had you next on the list if you changed your minds now. You've changed your minds, right? In that case, uh, David Henson, please. Okay, well, look, first of all, thanks very much, Jan, for a really exemplary presentation of much of the background, you know, to the really horrifying rise of the ultra right in Sweden, and to Rolf to giving some perspective uh, from Denmark. Uh, to show some of the fluidity with the sharp turns and sudden changes. So it's not that we're looking at straight lines, we're looking at curves and, and, and abrupt uh, turns uh, so that, you know, the, th this is not inevitable. In fact, it's political. In other words, it's, it's, it's in the governance of our ability to be able to reunite the left and to be able to resist the tendency towards this, uh, social destruction, uh, which the right wing is champion, championing, and uh, you know, and, and, and arm the working class. Can I say first of all, you know, we do need a global perspective to what's happening because I'm astonished to see these developments, and yet I have to confess that in South Africa it's black against black. Black immigrants are being killed on the streets of Johannesburg. Black immigrants are killed in the streets of Italy, and this this is the same phenomenon. In other words, the abuse that imperialism and colonialism has brought to this, you know, to developing countries. Let's use that term. With the war in Syria and uh, in, uh, the conflicts in Lebanon and the war again in Afghanistan, has produced just a desperate outpouring of of humanity to seek some security for their existence. Now we see that uh, Swedish people, or, or, or particularly the right wing, is, is highlighting this as a problem. But of course, it's been caused by the, the operation of capitalism on a, on a worldwide system where there's a freedom of capital to move, but there's not a freedom for labor you know, to move from, from one country to the other, uh, unless they're desperate uh, attempts to cross the Mediterranean and the like. 
And when that people do cross into South Africa, which is relatively more developed than Africa, then there's the most extreme violence against them too, uh, even though it's black people uh, and it's not uh, particularly a race issue, but an issue of citizenship. I just want to touch now on, on the issue. I was in a way doubting some of the questions on un unemployment but there are particularly high levels of unemployment in, in, uh, in Sweden. I see that the figures are between 7.6 or 8.5%, which is roughly double the figures that you'll see in Britain, in Germany, or in, uh, in, 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 the, United, uh, in the United States. So there is a particular problem, but we cannot see all these phenomena, uh, particularly the rise of the right, uh, only on a national grounds. We have to see this on international development, particularly uh, in Europe, with this uh, uh, astonishing uh, development uh, and the polarization of society uh, through all the crises which have been emerged, and particularly through the immigration crisis, so we say of about 2014 and there, thereafter, where many European countries have, have absolutely refused to take any Muslim or other or black uh, immigrants. And so, therefore, the burden has come on, on Sweden and so forth who are participating or wanting to participate in the EU uh, to take on more immigrants than others. And so there are disproportions all around. The question is, well, how does the working class respond to this? Do we say workers unite uh, to, to maintain our standards? The old slogan in South Africa is workers of the world unite, keep South Africa white. In other words, right in the bosom of the working class, there can be the most reactionary developments. And this is what I think um, we, you know, should be an, an alarming phenomenon, not just the, uh, uh, the parliamentary arithmetic, but the fact that these right-wing movements can get a grip on sections of the working class is actually a deep fear. And it should be uniting the working class, uh, all the claim to speak for the working class and building a united left against the right and spelling out the vastly destructive development which the ultra right is, is, is going to bring. Some people have a, on the left have an have a easy attitude to this and say, well, it'll just come and go and so forth. And there is some evidence, uh, you know, from Denmark that it's not going to be a phenomenon which is going to develop and, and develop deep roots. But when we see the development of a fascist uh, party getting most votes in, uh, in Italy, and now the same phenomenon in Sweden, we have to be totally blind not to realize that the future of democracy, the future of, uh, of, of our socialist ideas is at stake here. And I, I was hoping to hear from Jan and, and maybe also from Rolf, how the working class can unite. How can we build a united left to be able to fight against this phenomenon uh, without joining in with the right wing on, on the anti-immigration uh, uh, policies to be able to temper some of these policies, to see that what is when there are uprisings, as there have been conflicts... David, you've had five before, minutes now. I'm summing up. Uh, okay. That this is a phenomenon which is also seen in every country. America has such uprisings against the police. In Paris, this is what's happening. In Germany, we've seen these same developments. In other words, this is not completely isolated to, to Sweden. And we then have to develop a working class policies and un unity to be able to incorporate those who've been displaced by imperialism uh, into our societies and give them hope for the future as well as hope for our own people too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks very much, David. Uh, right, Matthew next, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks, comrades. Uh, just Mr. Man, it's fantastic to five minutes. Yeah, know. okay. All right, yeah, I'll try, I'll try and be, uh, be as quick as I can. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, it, it, it's a very useful presentation. I thank the comrades for it. Um, but obviously, the, you know, it, it, it's a, a, an effect of a, a series of, of, of things going on globally. Um, in terms of, as, as David said, you know, the effect of, 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 of imperialism uh, on, on sections of the world. I mean, you know, the, the actual demolition of entire countries like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, which, of course, uh, it, for, for, for many people has actually demolished the, the, the basis of, of, of society itself. So, of course, you know, there's, uh, there's huge numbers of people fleeing. Um, and, you know, it, it, it then comes to the, to the point, obviously, we now have 
the, the policy of, of fortress Europe and of, and of uh, killing people on the borders of Europe, um, which is in, you know barbaric basically. Um, so I mean, it, it, that that's the surrounding uh, point. The the the, the second quick point obviously is is the the. The position for fascism, of course, is, is, is predicated on the failure of the left. And we can see this in Italy, obviously, with the failure of the, uh, of the particularly of the, the PCI, um, over, over, over a whole period of time. I mean, you know, PCI, of course, should have, if it had been, been actually revolutionary as opposed to Stalinist, would have taken power in 1945. Um, and so we see the failure and actually the collapse in the 90s of the PCI into, into neoliberalism, essentially. The, the, the party of the original party posturing as being of the left has now gone over wholesale into, into neoliberalism. So you wind up the situation that you have now in Italy, of course, where you have a massive mass abstention. Over a third of people in Italy actually didn't vote. Um, and, and, and people t attempting to, to looking at any, any form of alternative to the filthy system that they've been, that's been forced on them by, by all the political forces on offer, um, you know, particularly, as I say, after the failure of the left. So the question really then becomes also what, what the state of the, of the workers' movement, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the activity uh, of the working class now, of course, is largely... Outside of the of, of, of the parliamentary uh, parties, certainly certainly in Britain, and I suspect in many many other places as well, that you know, you, you, in terms of you know what is the activity of the of, of left left organisations, what is the activity of the unions? Um, we're also, of course, facing this this vast question uh, of uh, you know the crisis of uh, immediate cost of living crisis, where it, it, essentially the, the the capitalist class. Is attempting to foist the cost of its war uh, in, in in Ukraine um, it, onto the working class, um, particularly obviously in energy, but also in, in food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the question: of what, what 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 is the what is the reaction response? And obviously, we're seeing you know huge demonstrations and so on, strikes are breaking out all over the place. Um, there's then uh, directly, of course, to the Swedish case. Uh, has been, of course, the 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 uh, corralling of Sweden and fi Finland and Sweden as another, effectively, an opening of another front against Russia by the by the US, which I presume is a, I mean, you know, you would assume um, is a process that's been ongoing for for for, for the last several decades. The US attempting to to ensure that the the um, uh, political systems within these countries actually will hold their hand up when required, and of course, when, once they once they've actually now declared. Um, wholesale war against uh, Russia that they, they they have brought these guys on online and of course you know Sweden the, virtually the whole Swedish system uh, social, uh, social democracy and so on has has fallen in line uh, with this uh, the, the, the the war drive um, which of course in itself is, is is a huge threat to 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 the future of humanity itself um, you know the possibility of nuclear war, and of course, is also the, the, the an effort by the declining American Empire to redivide the world, um, starting with Russia and obviously then its its rivalry with China. So there's a whole series of other other questions. That, for, but really, I think that for, for me, the key is to say, well, what what is the actual what is the nature of the left in in, in Sweden? You know, in terms of its activity and and of the and, and of the uh, of the workers' movement. I mean, it, you know, is it is it res responding uh, to to the, the the current state of uh, you know crisis? I mean, what you, what you describe a cri you know crisis which is recognisable to to all of us in terms of you know obviously the, the access to services, in terms of access to um, you know energy, food, housing, etc. Um, the question is okay. What 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 is the what is then the response? Thanks. Thanks very much, Matthew. Uh, Finn. You, I think you're muted, Finn. Oh, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Ooh. Right, we, we can't actually hear you, Matt. Just need to leave the meeting and rejoin Finn. Do you want to do that? Yeah. It happens sometimes. The only way out of it is to leave and come back in. Right, should we take Ed then while we're waiting for Finn to come back? Thank you, comrades. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um. In during during the uh, long post-war boom, 
of um, Western capitalism, uh, Sweden was always upheld by social democrats as the model of how society should be run. It wasn't um, uh, blatantly, openly, obviously, brutally capitalist. It was a, a sort of benign kind of capitalism with plenty of state intervention and high taxation and decent services for everybody. This was the, the, the sort of um, uh, the story that was told by social democrats to try and justify social democracy. And I think the discussion we're having today, the, the discussion that Jan introduced is very interesting because it illustrates just how superficial that, that analysis, that, that story was. Um, Sweden had some exceptional circumstances following the Second World War, particularly because out of nearly all the countries in Europe, Sweden wasn't directly involved in warfare, in destruction, in bombing, in, in uh, loss, of its, um, uh, loss of its young men. And therefore, at the beginning of the post-war boom, it had an advantage, an economic advantage, in that it was a stable, already developed country that didn't need to rebuild. Um, but even then, uh, it's not the case that Sweden was a, a model of um, capitalist um, success it, it, un, under sort of social democratic, um, uh, under social democratic government. Um, in, in 1990, there was a huge, uh, Jan, Jan can fill out the details if he's got time, but there was a huge economic crisis. The GDP fell by 5% within a few years. There was a huge rise in unemployment. So the booms and slumps that are a feature of capitalism, as described in Karl Marx's great work, were also a feature of, Swe of the Swedish economy because it was an economy where fundamentally the rule of profit was dominating the processes taking place at the top of society. And um, I think that, you know, it's very instructive of what Jan's told us today, because it, it shows that all capitalist countries, uh, even those that are proclaimed by social democrats to be healthier, better, more democratic, more responsive to the needs of the lowest paid and so on, all of them eventually uh, run out of possibilities of meeting the needs of the population in the way that these social democrats try to uh, try to describe. Now, I just want to ask. This is kind of a question to Jan and, and the uh, the Scandinavian comrades. I was very interested at the beginning of your lead off, Jan. In, in, you described these sort of parallel social structures that have developed that were kind of um, uh, perpetrating violence against the state and. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of undermining the state. And you, uh, what I noticed, you you identified the Muslim Brotherhood, Islamists, you identified criminal elements, but you did not identify, unless I misunderstood you, the Swedish Democrats. Are you therefore saying that the Swedish Democrats are somehow in the mainstream and they're not undermining the state, undermining the state as it exists? Because if... If that is what you're saying, I think you're not getting a balanced approach to this discussion because, it, it, you know, there may well be elements within the Muslim Brotherhood and so on that are whipping up antagonisms. But the fundamental drive for antagonism in, in a society like Sweden must surely be the far right. And I, I'd like you to clarify that because I, I wouldn't want... Um, any um, Muslim young people watching this program later on YouTube to get the impression that we are somehow blaming um, Islamists, but not blaming the fascists themselves for organizing the, um, the kind of um, antagonisms that are now becoming dominant within the Swedish state. So that's my question. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Ed. We've got four hands up now. So what I'm proposing to do, we take 
to take the four hand four people who got their hands up at the moment, and then I'm going to return to Jan because obviously a lot of questions have been thrown at him, and he does need some time to respond to those. So if we can take uh, Ken next, please. Thank you, Pam. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Right. Uh, I'll be brief if I can. Two yeah, questions, okay. really. Um, how and where did the Sweden Democrats build up their support? You mentioned the blue collar worker, which is an obvious source for their support. Did they focus on working within the cities in the first instance? How far do they have support outside the cities and the rural communities? And do they have support within elements of the establishment, for example, the police or, or even the civil service? And the second question is, to what extent is there a, a new, is there or a new party or a new social movement on the left to try and oppose the Sweden Democrats or are there no new parties outside the existing and established parties on the left? Because it does seem to me that the established parties on the left have evidently failed to provide an effective opposition to the Sweden Democrats. So are people looking to form new groupings or new movements to work against them? So those are my questions and thank you very much for the, the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. We're going to return to Finn now to see if we can hear him this time. He still can't. <laughs> right, I'm not sure what we're going to do about this unless it's anything you can put in the chat, Finn, uh, because I, I, I can't hear you at all for some reason. Sorry about that. OK, we'll have to move on to Roger then now, please. Roger. Roger, can you hear me? You can't hear me. Can anybody hear me? Okay, sorry. Oh, I've got, right. no, okay. okay, sorry. I, I didn't know you were calling me now. Yeah. Um, right, comrade. Look, I think it's been a really interesting and uh, vital uh, discussion, and I would like to hear more from uh, Jan. Um, about the general situation, but let's remember, well, first of all, I'd like to put it in context. I think it's not generally um, widely known about the huge traditions of the Swedish working class, that right from 1931, uh, when there was a, a massive and inspiring general strike, um, that from that time on, they, the Swedish Social Democrats were almost permanently in government until the recent uh, period. And that was because of the, it was not at all a question of the um, largesse and generosity and liberalism of the Swedish uh, ruling class, but because of the traditions and the militancy and the solidarity of, um, of the working class and the trade union movements. Now, having said that, this question about immigration obviously is a central uh, a central point uh, in the in the current situation and uh, I must say I was surprised by the uh, by the figures that um, Jan gave uh, nevertheless now the point is that the ruling class in Sweden and internationally or in the uh, so-called West um, during the entire boom years they could not get enough labor to um to exploit and that's why they sucked in huge numbers of um of the uh the working class populations from around the world and um in sweden too it was not a question of uh liberal liberal liberalism or or um sentiment that they uh, decided to be charitable towards the um the workers that they uh, sucked in to uh, Swedish industry, but it was a question of the, the of um, a, a hunger for exploitation of ever new reserves of labour. Now that was the case in um, in uh, all the countries of the, um, the so-called West or the imperialist countries, if you like. And um, the uh, now that the um, economy 
has uh, sharply changed towards uh, towards uh, since the crash really of 2008 and far worse so uh, now and in the future of course these immigrant populations provide uh, a very useful target as uh, scapegoats for the situation and um, i mean i would i would like uh, jan to uh illustrate that more with the with the situation and really that ties up to ed's uh, last question too i'd also like to say just finally i know the comrades in ume are i actually um had a long um association um with with um with that more than 40 years ago uh when i was f the uh first full-timer for the cwi i visited uh, the group in uh, in Umeå, and uh, I know that since then they built up, because I went also a few years back, um, I, I think really nearly 10 years ago now, but I went to a conference of the, of the, of the comrades in Umeå, and they had an absolutely spectacular organization. I know that um, uh, they've, they have um, had representation on the Umeå local council, for nearly, or um, no, I think actually 30 years. I know that Jan personally has been active uh, on that council for, 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 for 30 years. Now, I would like to know more. I know that in that time, they have had to um, contend with an extreme reactionary, racist, fascist group, more, more so than it was actually a split off from the Swedish Democrats called the, um, called the Alternative for Sweden and uh, that they're very active in Umeå, and that the comrades have um, conducted a heroic and militant campaign against them. I would like uh, Jan to explain more about that and give us more information. That's it, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Rod. We're just gonna have to ask the remaining comrades to be really brief now, because we are getting short of time for, for, for these questions to be addressed. So can I ask John or Dominic to come in next, please? You know, John. Can I uh, speak? Yeah, yep. John speaking. I would like to draw some parallels uh, to Britain and what's happened in Sweden. In the 1919 elections, we had the situation where the Labour Party bureaucracy and the um, Parliamentary Labour Party sabotaged Jeremy Corbyn. This in this was accompanied by the fact that the Liberal Democrats and Keir Starmer raised a whole issue about rerunning a referendum on Brexit. And Boris Johnson came in with a programme of get Brexit done and let's have some levelling up, particularly in the North and the Midlands, of the working class that have been largely neglected by Tory and Labour governments. The situation is one that I think in, un, in, if you like, coded language, in particularly the north of England, where you'd had serious scandals involving Labour councils and the police in grooming by Muslim groups in Rochdale, in Oldham, in Rotherham and in other places, and I think a lot of working class people, if you like the blue collar workers, were sickened by Labour councils going along and taking, if you like, their guidance from elements in particularly the Pakistani community. And I think that was part and parcel of, if you like, the big vote in Labour uh, areas you know, to vote Tory because the Tories were seen as, if you like, spelling out the need to have some sort of regulation, some sort of answerability. And, you know, I just see that in Sweden, <clears throat> the Social Democrats seem to have had turned a blind eye to what were serious, um, if you like, uh, antisocial behaviour among certain elements in the emigrant community that had been spelt out in the lead off. So I'd just like to say, at the moment, we're going through probably the craziest area of political activity in Britain that anybody has ever seen. 
where Liz Truss is possibly be going to be thrown out as the leader, as the prime minister before Christmas. But in normal circumstances, these are some of the issues, particularly in working class areas of the North and the Midlands, not in the big metropolitan towns of Manchester and Liverpool and Leeds, but in the Rochdales, in the Oldhams and places like that. So I'll leave it at that, comrades. OK, thanks very much, John. Um, unfortunately, we've not been able to hear Finn, but he has put a comment in the chat. So I'll just read it out in case anybody's not seen. Finn says, I do not agree with the emphasis that Jan gave to immigration numbers in his opening contributions, though I do realise that Jan and his party have a very good re record in their local areas in fighting fascists. So maybe in a minute when we go back to, to Jan, he can, um, he can just uh, respond to that. We have got another hand up. I did say that Finn would be the last contribution. But David, if you want to ask something really quick and a big quick, less than a minute, <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to help Jan with uh, replying to some of the questions. There was, I heard one of the comrades was you'll speaking. Have to be, David, you'll have to be very quick because I do want to let Yeah, Jan yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really quick about okay, two things. You. It was the, the COVID uh, response. I mean, all of the parties in Sweden agreed on this COVID strategy that was used in Sweden. And there, there has been basically no criticism of the policy. And it, was, it wasn't even a part of the, the election campaign. So it, has, it played no role at all in, in, uh, uh, before the elections. Yes. When it came to, to the issue of, the, uh, of NATO membership, that was also sort of picked off the agenda before the election. Because back in uh, after the invasion of Ukraine, uh, the moderate party, the Tory party of Sweden, they said they would make, uh, if they would win the election, they would bring Sweden into NATO. And this sort of changed, uh, it started an internal debate in the Social Democrats, where they uh, had an extremely undemocratic so-called internal de de debate where uh, they basically in two months, they just switched positions. They forced their entire party to to agree that the best course of action would be to join, uh, to bring Sweden into NATO. And I mean, there were even there was such a pressuring propaganda campaign in the media, uh, pro NATO, and even left wing social democrats who were high profile. They went out and said, "Yeah, well, I used to be against NATO, but now." I think the best course of action would be to join. So, so basically, the, the NATO issue was also brought off the table before the election. The only two, the only party who was against NATO, which is uh, the other parties who were against NATO, which actually was the Sweden Democrats, they just changed the party line, that changed like this, and the left party who are against NATO, they never campaigned on it during the election campaign. So. Just to answer those questions, COVID and NATO just they 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 were brought off in pretty undemocratically. They were brought off the agenda before the elections. That's great. Thanks so much for those points, Davis. Right, we're going to return to Jan now and ask him to do the impossible, which is to respond to as many of those questions and points as he possibly can in about twenty minutes or so. Do you think you can uh, give it a go, Jan? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm not sure I heard Roger's question. Could you please, in, in the beginning of your contribution, Roger, uh, there was a question. I didn't get it. I couldn't hear it. Oh. Well, I think I was, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you fine, yeah. Uh, my, first, my first point was about how the ruling class in Sweden and internationally encouraged immigration. In fact, they wanted to uh, suck in as much human labour power as they could in order to exploit it. And then uh, in the, um, that must go for Sweden too. The, 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 the Swedish uh, ruling class didn't, didn't um, invite immigrants in just out of charity and um, sentiment, but because uh, but in order to uh, to exploit them, and um, uh, well, I'm asking you if that is the case. But now, of course, 
uh, they are no longer need their labor. Uh, and that's in all the um, in all the um, countries, the imperialist countries. Uh, but at the same time, they find the immigrants uh, very handy scapegoats in order to uh, divide the ruling class, the, the working class. So that's my question. Also, the other question was to ask you to explain more about your record, which I know is a very um, creditable one in fighting the ultra fascist uh, party in Umeå. All right. Well, nobody has been, have had as many death threats <laughs> from right wing groups and Nazi groups as uh, the, the workers, the members of the workers party groups, and especially myself uh, as a front figure. Today, we are trying to uh, prevent the alternative for Sweden, who obviously took its name from alter uh, alternative from Germany. This is a close to the border of Nazism, na, 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 uh, Nazism party. Uh, it, it's really the expelled youth league from the Swedish Democrats. The Swedish Democrats uh, tried to um, reform and they did reform themselves they i remember in 1993 when they were marching shouting sieg heil and doing this salute now today they have expelled uh, the whole youth league they tried to reform it, but <laughs> they had to expel them all. And that is the basis for alternative for Sweden, the former youth league of the Swedish Democrats. And today they are more like other, uh, we call them new reactionary parties. Uh, more like Le Pen's movement in France. They are not na na Nazis, you, you couldn't say that. But they are very reactionary and they have a certain, a, a very strong appeal to blue color workers. Uh, since 2015, in Sweden, there is a tra in Umeå there is a tradition uh, to to remember the the Kristall Kristallnatten, the you know the November 9, 1938, when the Nazis in Germany stepped up their attacks against the Jews. Since 2015, we in, in the Worker, Workers' Party group organizes these, uh, well, demonstrations or manifestations uh, against racism, anti-Semitism and Nazism. And all the other parties, except uh, Swedish Democrats, are invited. So we have a, a good record in fighting Nazism, racism, and uh, right-wing extremism in Umeå. And, and uh, alternative for Sweden, has not really taken off yet, but we are trying to 
make them not to take off. Speaking about anti-Semitism, I will come back to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood as the main force of uh, Islamism in, in Sweden. What, what is it? What is the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, let me quote their theological leader. I quote from 2009. Throughout history, Allah has imposed upon the Jews people who would punish them for their corruption. The last punishment was carried out by Hitler by means of all the things he did to them, even though they have exaggerated this issue, he managed to put them in their place. This was divine punishment for them. Allah willing, the next time will be at the hand of the believers. This is the theological just deceased leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, as part of our fight against anti-Semitism, we are fighting the Muslim Brotherhood. They are not only just as hostile to Jews as uh, the alternative for Sweden. There are so many more. But they are also oppressing uh, other Muslims. There is a division amongst the Muslims. And the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, oppressing other Muslims. So if we want to defend the rights of Muslim immigrants, we must fight the Muslim Brotherhood. And that is essential to understand. Now, it has always been very hard for the left to understand uh, the question of immigration. Now, if anybody believes that social democracy do not defend their own welfare state, they are retreating all over. And they have not only ruled with bourgeois budgets, three of the eight years in power, or without power, but in position. They have abandoned a very famous law from 1976 uh, uh, about workers' protection. Uh, the, the, you know, you, you couldn't be sacked anyway. They have retreated on that. And they have started to undermine collective bargaining. They have retreated when it comes to the right for people who own house, houses to, to put the rent for free. I mean, to hide the rent just as much as they want. And they have abandoned a very sacred promise to stop. Uh, lowering the tax because lowering the tax will undermine the welfare state. They have retreated on all these issues. And that's uh, the basic thing. How did uh, the left party react to that? Well, the left party was for a former communist party. 
but today it is a social demo. Uh, I mean, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Swedish Communist Party leaned heavily upon their economic support from the Soviet Union. They got economical support from the Soviet Union. And they also morally leaned very heavily against the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, they started to lean very heavily among the Swedish against social democracy. So when we are speaking about ideology, we have two social democratic party in Sweden. One is named the Social Democrats and what the other is named the left party, but they have the same ideology. Well, uh, I don't know if the comrades want to understand, but the thing is that if Sweden take between five to 10 times as many immigrants, this is the general situation. Social democracy do not fight to defend anything. That they have been uh, famous for doing. And I will remind you that uh, Sweden still belongs to the group of most equal countries in the OECD, despite a rapid surge of income inequality since the early 1990s. I will say again, the growth of inequality between 1985 and the early 2000s 2010s was the largest among all OECD countries, increasing by one third, which is a bit uh, one third. Well, it's a bit confusing, but still, the division was larger in Sweden than in any other comparable country. Now, when you upon that have uh, immigration policy which means that Sweden uh, on a, for many, many years uh, took uh, between five to 10 times the average number of asylum seekers as the average uh, country in the European Union. And I will remind you about this figure and try to accept that this is the truth. In 2015, the number of asylum seekers that was accepted into Sweden was 33 times as many as in United Kingdom. If we taking into comparison the number of the, the, you know, the scale of population. This has uh, changed Sweden. One out of five uh, citizens in Sweden living today are not born in Sweden. And they have children and their children have children. Now, the Swedish labor market couldn't bear, they couldn't cope with this. And the Swedish housing market couldn't cope with this. And um, if we look at the numbers, I will try to find them because people born inside of, inside People born in Sweden, they have uh, an unemployment uh, in about 5.4% unemployment. People not born in Sweden, their unemployment is close to 20%. This means that uh, Yeah, you have five, you have five minutes left. Okay. The, 
the part of the working class who are, uh, are have the worst conditions is the immigrants but also there is a large part of the immigrants that Marx would call the Lumpen proletariat. And it is out of those sections that you could uh, see the criminal, often uh, family-based networks, and also the influence from Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists, Islamist groups. And if you go back to the right-wing extremists and the Muslim brotherhoods, they uh, sort of connect. <laughs> the Muslim brotherhood could point at the uh, sw Swedish Democrats and say, there are your enemies and they will gain among other Muslims. And the Swedish Democrats could point at the Muslim Brotherhood and say, look, they are all the same. And so they sort of thrive on each other. This perspective, as I tell you, these words, we are the only one who, who could make this uh, sort of connection, but it is really, that's the way it is. So we are fighting uh, the Swedish Democrats. And we are, of course, fighting the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the so-called left has tried to deny the problems of excessive immigration by calling all asylum seekers workers. And, and, and by playing with words, there is no problem. But no problem in society disappears because somebody play with words. And the workers are not stupid. So if, if we put forward a policy that must be a policy to defend the welfare state. It must be a policy to defend workers' rights. And who is splitting the working class? Well, of course, social Democrats are splitting the working class. The Swedish Democrats are splitting the working class. And the Muslim Brotherhood is splitting the working class. Now we can uh, put forward a policy like that in, in, in Umeå. And that is why today, when there was uh, an Iranian support protest because of the, the woman who was killed when she didn't have her... her uh, Headscarf. Yeah. We were, of course, invited to, to speak because we have this reputation of always standing up to, the, to, to, to immigrants. But one thing that have led to, to uh, that we have such uh, immigrants have such uh, a big respect for us is that we, they, they all know that we, we, we will defend uh, Muslims against far-right attacks, but we will uh, also defend Muslims against their own oppressors within their own community, and that is the Muslim Brotherhood. And once again, uh, what has been the dominant thing is that, and I will end with this, social democrats, the left party, the greens, they have put a blind eye 
to the problems caused by excessive immigration. Now, they suddenly changed and said, we are going to deal with this, the consequences. We are going to deal with the criminal networks. We are going to deal with the Islamists. We are going to deal with all those uh, things. But the problem is that the Swedish Democrats have said this, but in a racist way, 10 years, five years, they, they, this question is already theirs. So when social Democrats suddenly start to talk about it, and when the left party suddenly starts to talk about it, and the Green Party suddenly starts to talk about it, nobody will believe them because the, the Swedish Democrats have all, already taken the, the, those issues they are connected with the Swedish uh, Democrats. And that's why they lost the election. They, they are not, nobody believes them. The workers are, are, are feeling abandoned because the problems are real. And uh, I wish we had time to go deeper into this thing with parallel society. But there are great, great areas in, in uh, like Gothenburg, where criminal networks rule. Every restaurant, every shop pay dues like uh, to the mafia, to criminal networks, or the Muslim Brotherhood. They rule certain areas, and that's no secret. So what has to be done? Well, not the Swe Swedish Democrats. They would like to start a civil war. Of course, we don't want that. But if we don't divide Islamists from Muslims in general, there is no way to go forward to talk about class uh, solidarity, because the Muslim Brotherhood is a menace to a lot, to the majority of Muslims. This is hard for the left in general to understand. But the Workers' Party group, we got 3,000 votes. Like fifteen thousand of. Let's Ulo's... get to sum up, Jan, now, because we we've only got a couple of minutes 15, left. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Fifteen thousand of the people in Umeå are listening to us. We we got to have a policy in these questions. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jan. I think that was a, a most informative uh, talk we've had from you and a very very useful discussion. So. I'd just like to particularly thank Jan for, for the work he's put in, for giving us this presentation, and also for the supplementary um, contribution of Maddie. Maddie and, and Jan obviously both live in Sweden. And just thank all the other comrades for the contributions and questions. Obviously, this is a subject we're not going to crack in in a couple of hours, so I think, uh, I think we're sure we'll be re returning to it in the future. So uh, can we move on now to Roger, who may want to say something about next week's meeting? Uh, well, I'm going to pass on that task to David because uh, he is organising next week's meeting. But I would like to say first, um, I think it's been a really crucial discussion we've had today. And I think it's very, very important that we continue it. Because I have to say what I didn't quite get from Jan's contribution is what actually is the programme that the comrades are putting forward on the immigration uh, on the immigration question and as david has said in the chat this is an issue which is not at all um, peculiar to sweden but it's an issue that faces uh, all of us in uh, in all the in all the countries um that are you know uh, of which there are comrades here so i i hope that we can have a discussion again 
Uh, we we did have one um, a few months ago on the question of um, the rise of the far right. But I think we should have another one uh, soon and uh, a practical discussion on the policy of how we combat this uh, growing uh, growing threat. As for next week, um, over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, uh, Roger. Um, and, and also my thanks uh, to Jan and to others who've uh, participated. It's been an excellent discussion. Um, can I say then the coming week, we are looking to a, for a discussion uh, about Southern Africa. It seems a little broad, but what we want to do is to bring together uh, trade unions who are committed to workers' control in trade unions, which is a, a, a strong left tendency developing in Southern Africa. Uh, we want to hear their voices. We want to hear their program and to see how we can unite the very, um, what can I say, the very cut off sections of the working class in Namibia, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Swaziland and elsewhere. How do we unite the working class when it is faced with violent uh, nationalism, xenophobia and the rest? And how do we build a working class uh, instrument through the trade unions, which is really going to be effective. So that basically is what we're in frame, but we are having discussions which will be uh, undertaken on Monday, Roger. And then I'll come forward with a brief about how we'll go about that discussion. Mm. Mm. Okay, thanks very much, David. Well, Roger will send the notification out in the course of the week. Hope we'll all be able to come next week. So that is the end of the meeting. Solidarity. See you next week. Bye, comrades, and thanks bye. again to Jan. Yes, Thank thanks, you. Jan. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Well...